Okay, so uh, welcome to um, the third, uh, the second panel of uh, Manchester in, uh, in Translation's uh, uh, week-long uh, conference. Uh, my name is Rob Page. I'm from uh, Karma Press. Um, today's panel is uh, how to survive and thrive as a literary publisher, and we're really, really uh, grateful to and, and privileged to have uh, three fantastic uh, uh, young translators uh, today. We have. Um, uh, Harani Baroka, who, who goes by the name of Oka. Um, uh, Oka is an Indonesian writer and artist and translator. Uh, she's Modern Poetry and Translation's inaugural poet in residence and is a research in residence and research fellow at UAL's um, Decolonizing Arts Institute and associate artist at the uh, UK's National uh, Centre for Writing. Uh, she's also, as I say, an editor and uh, a poet. Um, we also have um, Ruth Clark, who is a translator from the Italian, French and Spanish. Uh, she has translated work from authors as, uh, as far as from, from Benin to Venezuela, uh, to Venezuela. Um, her translation of uh, Evelina Sant'Angelo's novel uh, From Another World will be published by Granta next year. Ruth is also the founding member of the London-based Translators Collective, uh, the Starling Bureau. Uh, and finally, we have uh, Savad Hussein, who is a uh, writer and a translator from the Arabic. She is the winner of the 2019 Arab Lit, uh, Arab Lit Short Story Prize. And as a translator, she's the winner of two English Pen Translates Awards. Uh, she co-teaches a workshop on translating Arabic comics at UK secondary schools via the collective uh, Shadow Heroes. Um, uh, and uh, her recent translations include uh, the Resistance novella, Passage to the Piazza, which was shortlisted for the 2020 Palestine Book Awards. Um, that's a very, very brief introduction. As you can probably tell, uh, all three of our guests are very, very busy and have very, very sort of diverse, uh, uh, very broad uh, career portfolios. As a translator, you have to uh, probably do a number of other uh, jobs, which kind of brings me on to my very first question. Could, you, could each of you uh, talk a little bit uh, introduce yourselves a bit more and uh, tell us how you first got into translating, uh, uh, literary translation in particular, and what was your first break? Um, how, what was your, your, your big break? How did that happen? Um, and how also, how, you, how do you balance your translation work with other work? What other work do you do? And I'm going to start with you, Ruth, if that's okay. Sure. Um, so I've got quite a traditional academic background in translation it was what I wanted to do when I set out on my BA which was in languages I was able to do three languages at Durham University so I was able to split my degree equally between French, Spanish, Italian language and literature all nicely balanced as a combination that I thought great this is what I want to do with my life. Um, it didn't go smoothly in that direction <laughs> um, but then I went on to do an MA in translation studies at Sheffield and from that uh, I was able to get an in-house job in a translation agency so that's completely commercial work it was a legal translation specialist so I did even more translation training there in very specific legal terminology and that's still something that I do I work for translation agencies um, translating a lot of judgments and contracts and things that are really not um, not literary in any sense but it's a nice practice of translation to still keep up and I think any writing any translating is useful and sometimes that like knowing things about the legal system and the police system actually comes in quite useful for a lot of literary work it saves you a bit of research time um, after I'd worked in house for five years, I decided to go freelance and kind of manage my manage my own workload, which, you know, has its has its pros and cons. Um, knowing when to say yes and when to say no is yeah. um, it's always a gamble, and it usually goes wrong. So I don't know <laughs> I don't know how people manage. Uh, more successfully than I do and I think a lot of people don't it's just a kind of jumble of sometimes you have all the work and sometimes you have no work um I find things tend to land back on my desk at exactly the same time with a kind of can you do this in in a week or can you do this in two weeks um request and 
you kind of just have to find a way to do it or you can find the deadlines that you can push. Um, it's, uh, it's not something that I've found there's a magic solution to um, in terms of like managing freelance life. It just, it just comes at you <laughs> and you just kind of have to ride it. Um, uh, so I didn't, I've still failed to manage my workload in that sense. Um, but I went to the BCLT summer school in 2012, where I did, like, I, I met literary translators, I met people who wanted to be literary translators, I met publishers, I met editors, I met um, people who were involved in this world that I wanted, I'd always sort of wanted to be in. And that for me was kind of the big, the big moment of, okay, these, these are just, these are just regular people and they like talking about books. So I can go to, I can go to events where, where people talk about books and translation and, uh, and have a nice time and that's networking. Um, so it's, it's really nice when networking doesn't feel like work. Uh, I think um, the connections that I made at BCLT Summer School, I mean, some of them became what is now the Starling Bureau. So we formed an actual translators collective. Um, that, that's a kind of more official term for sort of what, what translators do all the time anyway, but I'm sure I'll, I'll talk about that later. And what was, was there a specific kind of book uh, or deal that really um, established you? Um, I think, I mean, my first, my, the first full novel that I translated by myself, I think that always feels like a landmark. Um, I'd done co-translations, I'd done short stories in anthologies, I'd done articles, um, I'd done non-fiction books even, but somehow if you want to be a, a literary translator, it's like, well, that doesn't really count because it's, it's not it's not the dream so yeah getting to do a full novel which again came through somebody somebody had recommended me to do um a reader's report and then from the reader's report I did a sample um it's it's usually kind of kind of a lucky process of you're asked to do something that's again it's something that you enjoy so you 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 put something extra into it um if you enjoy if you enjoy a book and you say yeah I'd be happy to do a sample of it um and then usually someone else is also doing a sample of it so that that doesn't always come off so it's like the first time that that happened it was like wow it works right thank you um uh Savad I'll ask you next what's what's your origin story how did you first <laughs> enter the literary translation scene yeah, so I'm not sure, you know, at what stage our viewership is at. So I'm going to, as Ruth said, like, I'll take you back to um, when I was at university. So I was at college in the U.S. and actually was admitted for pre-med. So I was doing medicine. Um, but after my first year, and I'd always wanted to be a doctor since, you know, I was a kid, I just realized this actually isn't for me. And I was taking um, French and Arabic at the same time, just always having had a lot of languages in my home life. And I switched my major to Arabic and French to the great chagrin of my family because my mother was like, how are you going to make any money if you're not a banker, a lawyer, or a doctor? Um, very typical sort of like subcontinental mindset, right? So what are you going to do with these languages? Um, so I graduated with languages and I became a teacher of Arabic. So I was teaching Arabic for about 10 years. My first foray into literary translation was in 2008 when I was doing my master's at SOAS. I was approached um, by a translation company, I think just because I had like sent out a few CVs earlier in the year to do a manuscript for them, like a Palestinian book. So I translated it and it never got published, which is actually really great because it wasn't such a great book. It was just someone who had approached this, you know, company to ask them to translate their book. And once I had first done that book, I was like, oh, this is so easy. Like I could make this my career. Like, let's just like switch to literary translation. <laughs> and then I didn't get anything for the next six years. Um, and in that time I had just been teaching, but building up my portfolio slowly with like small pieces here and there on Arab Lit, on Asymptote. But I think what's really important for people to recognize is it's not always, you don't always have to just do like straight literary translation. I was doing a lot of cultural work. So I was, you know, um, reviewing books. I was going to literary festivals wherever I was living, whether it was like in Johannesburg or Dubai and like 
interviewing authors there all for free just because like you know I was loving what I was doing but just on the weekend and then pitching those interviews to different outlets and being like hey would you want an interview with such and such author who was just here uh, especially if you're speaking a language where the authors don't generally speak in English I found it you know quite easy to place interviews when I'm speaking with authors who only speak Arabic right then I'm giving you know such outlets like access to authors who they don't usually hear from so by the time I got my actual first book, which was published, was thankfully due to networking, which was due to Ruth Ahmed Kemp, who translates from German, Arabic, and Russian. Yeah, a lot of people might know her. So she had been offered to do a book by Signal 8 Press, which is a small press in Hong Kong, a Jordanian science fiction book. And she had done the author's first book, but she had too much on to do the second one. And she was like, oh, do you want to do it? And I was like, sure, great, because I'd been doing all these samples for houses like Bloomsbury and American University Cairo Press, and they would love the sample and they would take the book, but they would never ask me to do the book just because they said, well, you've never done a full length book. They didn't say it in so many words, but they were basically like, we don't trust you. Right. So I was like, OK, fine. So the thing is, with this book, with, which I did for Signal A Press, I basically did it for free because I didn't get any fee up front. And I was only paid in royalties, which, you know, the book didn't sell remarkably well. However, what I and I don't encourage translators to do this, but I will say it kind of opened the floodgates. Because at that point, once I'd gotten that one book, then I had already had like six years of all this other stuff I'd been doing, right? Like samples and interviews and whatnot. And after that, now we're what, in 2021, and I've published six books and have seven others in the pipeline. So that's 13 books, right? Which is really great. And a lot of people are like, whoa, like, where did you come from? Like, how did you get all these books so quickly? And I'm just like, listen, like, it's not really quick. It didn't happen overnight, right? I've been doing this for 12 years now. And only now, yeah, I'm coming, it seems like I'm coming on the scene, but it's just kind of the way things have accumulated. So yeah, that was my breakthrough moment. And I would say, just having done that one uh, book length project gave publishers the confidence to be like, okay, you know, we like your sample and somebody else used you for a book. So we think, you know, we can trust you to do a book as well. And sometimes that first project is not going to be ideal. It might not be a book you like. It might not be the payment terms you want, like case in point, like I didn't get paid for it. Um, but what I did gain from it, I think was invaluable. And I would, I would do it again, just because it gave me that sort of in into the industry that I needed. Um, so yes, I think, yeah. Thank you. Uh, perfect. Um, and Oka, how did, how did you, uh, establish yourself, uh, establish yourself as a, a literary translator? So first of all, like many people, millions of people around the world, I mean, in, I'm Indonesian, Indonesia has over 700 languages and I grew up bilingual, um, in English and Indonesian, but there was always other languages swirling around me right at home and just in Jakarta everywhere. Um, so I'd have like Baso Minang from my mother's side or Javanese from my dad's side. And I just, I think I've been translating since I was a toddler, right? Like, again, like millions of kids do if you grow up with different cultures around you. Um, and then I was a very dorky teenager <laughs> to nobody's surprise. And at around the age of 12 or 13, I was like, you know how people have weekend jobs or things like that. I translate all the time. I might as well do this as a job. So I started an unpaid internship at um, English Tempo. Tempo is Indonesia's largest news magazine. And they were like, okay, kid, like we'll let you like translate for free, like for a couple months or something. And then um, I was, good, I guess. And then it turned into a paid job. Um, and then I, long story short, I often, like many, many Indonesians I know who are bilingual, often on freelance translation jobs for different, you know, NGOs or this and that. Um, when I graduated uni, I worked um, in aid work first for the UN and then very briefly as a journalist for the BBC. And that all, both jobs involve translation pretty much full time, right? You're translating reports to and from Indonesian. Um, you're writing reports in different lang in, in both languages. Um, so translation was a very heavy part of my job as a journalist. And I realized I was not cut out to be a journalist. I didn't want it to, and I actually really wanted to, to go more into an artistic field, which um, I think a boss actually told me once, they were like, you do a lot of arts features. <laughs> like, wink, wink, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I think you're into the same. I was like, you're right, I am. Um, and then um, uh, I got a scholarship to do a master's in um, basically experimental new media at NYU Tisch. And um, 
then from there, I started to do a lot of um, more art installations, combining artistic work with literary work, um, in which translation always played a part. And along the side, always, again, doing freelance translation jobs for this, that, and the other. Um, and I would say, I think my first big break in terms of um, becoming an author who uses translation in my book. So I've, I've translated individual pieces and short stories, but one thing I really um, revel in as somebody who likes thinking about translation theory and um, looking at different ways to push translation um, through art and writing uh, was when, so I did a, a show at Edinburgh Fringe in the summer of 2014 and there was an ad for it. And Deborah Smith of Tilted Texas Press saw this ad. We started following each other on Twitter and um, she DM'd me about, she's like, oh, I'm, I, I'm applying for funding to start this, you know, small literary press, Tilted Access, do you have any recommendations from Tunisians who, you know, she didn't know that I had manuscripts lined up that I wanted to publish. So I was like, could you, would you like look at these and see if you'd like to publish them? Um, that became Indigenous Species, which is my first book in 2016. And things coincided really well because I just got a scholarship to do my PhD at Goldsmiths in Visual Cultures, which again involves a lot of translation and involved a lot of, um, I did performance installations in different languages. Um, so it was really nice to be able to come to the UK with a book deal uh, before, right beforehand. And that sort of, and because I was already writing about translation and doing artistic projects that involve translation. And this is where I really like to trouble the word literary because I think oral traditions and translations are also literary. And I had done stuff, you know, in community groups that I turned into art projects, et cetera. Um, which, uh, so Deborah was like, oh, you should, you know, um, I want Sophie Collins to look at your projects and that became, you know, contribution to the anthology, to the anthology Currently an Emotion, which is an anthology of translations edited by Sophie Collins. So really going into the UK, I was already kind of connected in the mix. And then I got to see um, this book uh, come out with English, Indonesian, Baso Minang and fake Braille, because that was a, that's the thing in the book. If, if the book supposed to be a translation of absence and the absence of accessibility in publishing. Right. So, um, so from the very beginning, all of my works have had multiple languages and a multiplicity of ways of looking at translation. So I consider myself a literary translator insofar as I think through translation and I write about it um, and I publish work on it as well as publishing others work. Um, so a, aside from doing freelance stuff, I think ha being an artist and a writer and an editor and a translator, um, you kind of do run in, in similar circles and you never know what a connection will lead to. I certainly didn't know for instance that if I get funding to do a solo show at Edinburgh, Deborah Smith's gonna see the ad and contact me, you know? I mean, things sort of lead to the other. And I think if you're really passionate about it um, and you're really interested in how people use trans and genuinely interested in, um, in the directions it's going and in the ways we can trouble the notion of literary and also in building community, uh, like Savad, I'm part of Shadow Heroes, which is a, a collective of translators um, who are interested in how translation can increase critical thinking in schools. Um, but we also have a collective that is peer support and um, uh, sharing tips and, and tricks and uh, uh, giving each other um, uh, advice and, and information and how others' careers are shaping up and what to do in different languages. Um, and I think also one thing that I always try and do is to stay connected to people in Indonesia or people who work in Indonesian. Um, it's a very small uh, world when you think about it um, uh, in terms of translation and, and, and literary production in Indonesia and sort of being in the same circles. And I think um, connecting with people who are translators with similar worldviews as well and similar sort of an activist mindset about what needs to be done in translation um, uh, brings you a really uh, good sense of collectivity. So I do feel connected to Indonesian translators, whether they're in Australia or in Indonesia or in Europe um, and continue to do projects with them. Thank you. I think it, it's, it's remarkable how many different uh, routes have just been covered. You've, you're talking, uh, you, we, we've mentioned uh, literary, um, literary agencies, visual arts, journalism, um, uh, academia, 
it's, it's just a, it demonstrates that there's no one uh, single route uh, to this career. Um, I should say that if anybody has any questions, there have already been uh, lots coming up on the uh, YouTube channel, but please put your questions in the YouTube channel. We'll try to get to as many of them as possible at the end. Um, yeah. What you were saying there, Oka, brings, brings us on to the next question, which is the importance of, uh, of networking. Um, from looking at it from a distance, because from afar, because I'm not a translator, I'm an editor, um, the translation community seems to be the most well networked um, kind of uh, literary community out there. There were there were lots and lots of very very well developed networks. There were mentorship programs. There were um, summer schools, but there were also kind of associations of different uh, language translation uh, translators. And I just wondered, um, I, I wanted to ask you first, Ruth. Um, what you in you in particular set up Starling Bureau? Um, wh why did you do that, and what's what is it that translators kind of really benefit from or, or get from these networks? Um, the main thing I think translators get from networks, and possibly why we seem to be quite good at it, is we are working on our own in isolation a lot of the time. I think most people work at home I mean, ordinarily in not in the middle of a pandemic people still work at home maybe in their bedroom maybe at their kitchen table and the chances to go out and talk about your work with other people um it's it's enjoyable and it's necessary and it feeds your practice so it's kind of it's kind of organic that these things pop up um but with the styling bureau i think uh we were inspired initially by uh, there's a collective of literary translators in New York, Sedilla and Co. And they um, looked at um, models of actors and agents that they knew um, and thought, how can we, will we, will we be better at this if we do it together? Um, and we were inspired by that idea. What is it that we do? And are, can, how how is how are we able to make our voices louder if we put them together um and how can we expand our reach if we if we do things together and that's how we ended up being called the starling bureau because starlings in those memorations form little groups of like something like seven starlings um so that they don't get lost in that big like thousands of voices um if you've got your your little your little group I don't know what the word is for that little group of starlings um but if you've got your little group then you're not you don't you don't feel so much like you're shouting into the void um and I think um we wanted to be able to uh, expand our network of contacts and we wanted to be able to pitch work to publishers be more effectively and and better and something that we realized was it's a lot easier to pitch somebody else's work. It's sometimes easier to say nice things about work that someone else has done that you've read and gone, wow, that's really good. Somebody should publish that than it is to say, I've, I've got this idea and I've done this thing and it's really important to me. So someone should love it. If you say somebody told me about this thing, I heard about it. I remembered it. It was good. And I want to tell it to you because I think it would suit your list. Um, that's a way of like, it's a kind of incorporating that word of mouth factor that really helps that level of enthusiasm uh, that really helps to push a book forward. So you were pitching other translators works? Yeah, so the, one of the ideas is that we all know the work that the other translators have uh, produced pitch, like a, a, a pitch sort of package for that they could send to a publisher and uh, we know the, the sample text that they've produced for that book. We've done editing workshops of those. So it's not like you're able to talk in the same way as someone who's read the whole book, because obviously fundamentally that's what we're doing. We can't read each other's books yeah. on the whole, um, but we can read the sample. So it's kind, It's almost also like you've got a little test pitch there of like, well, if it works, if it sounds like, the other translators would want to publish it if they were a publisher or if they would want to recommend it to, to someone or if they can think automatically, oh, that sounds like a book for such and such a press, um, then you know you've got a winner. And then wh whether it goes anywhere is a different story, but 
it's kind of a filter of, is this book really worth investing my time? Great. And um, uh, Savad, you talked about the fact that uh, with uh, the, the London Book Fair being cancelled last March, um, you uh, and lots of the uh, Arabic translators set up the ALTS. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? And also maybe maybe talk about how important fairs are, um, uh, book fairs are for kind of book deals and, and, and for translators. Yeah, so uh, what ended up happening last year is a number of us, like in terms of Arabic to English translators, found ourselves just in London because the book fair had been cancelled. And um, uh, a colleague of ours, Nariman Youssef, um, um, managed to uh, reserve a room for us at the British Library. So we all met there. And that's actually, it sounds quite ridiculous, but because we're so used to working in isolation, that's the first time a lot of us met each other face to face or actually had such a meeting, even though, you know, we've all been working for about, you know, 10 years or so in Arabic to English literary translation. Um, so yeah, so we established the LTS, which is Arabic Literary Translators, and the S, I don't remember what it is for, um, but you know, if you are someone who does translate from Arabic to English and you have published something online, you don't have to have a book length publication, you can reach out to me on Twitter and I'll get one of the admins to add you. And it's just a wonderful sort of forum where we you know, discuss opportunities for Arabic to English literary translators. We just had our first workshop last weekend. Um, you know, on Zoom discussing works that we're working on. And it's just a really a supportive community. But having said that, I think what I recognized, you know, only maybe four years into my career is that it's so important to have relationships and be in touch with translators who are outside of your language pair. Originally, I thought, oh, well, you translate from German, like, I'm sorry, I'm not going to learn much from you. So I'm not really going to talk to you. Uh, and then I only realized later on that actually, you can learn so much from people who work from other languages, just because of the commonalities in translation. So not only the actual craft aspect of it, but the practicalities of the day to day. So things like, you know, contracts, or, um, you know, I was uh, introduced to one of the publishers I was working with by Antonia Lloyd Jones, who works from Polish, right? So, you know, translators are very generous people, and they're willing to share, you know, their editor contacts or other sort of, um, uh, ex advice that they have with you. So, you know, whenever I'm in a tricky situation and I'm negotiating a contract with a publisher, I can ask some of my friends who have worked with this publisher from other languages, what was your experience? What rate did you get? Because, you know, as Ruth was saying, when you're just working in sort of isolation or you're just in, you, you know, screaming into the void, it's very difficult for you to, you know, figure out what should I be asking for? Uh, what is reasonable. And a lot of times I think translators undersell themselves. Um, but when you just speak to somebody else who was able to get a higher rate, you're like, oh, well, I should have just asked for that in the first place, right? And so, you know, that sort of knowledge is power. I'm not sure if you want to hear this raw because you're a publisher and you're just like, you know, it's like translators are going to be asking you for higher rates. But, you know, if you're paying it to somebody else, there's no reason why you shouldn't pay it to another person, right? Um, so, that's what I would guess I would say in terms of um, networking and the importance of networking. Was there another part to your question or? Um, yeah, just what you, what you benefit from, um, how you benefit from, from those networks and how useful they are. Um, but I think you've, you've, you've covered that. Um, uh, okay, is it, is it, are there similar networks or support uh, kind of networks for, um, for Indonesian writers? Yes, and to echo Savad, it's nice to have both a network in your language or languages that you translate in from to, and also cross um, nationality, cross language networks as well. I think it's important to have both. Um, so in terms of Indonesian networks of translators, it's quite informal. Um, these are people who I've sort of come up alongside meet them at events, um, have been on panels with them, um, meet on Twitter, you know, and, and then eventually meet in real life. Um, you know, like people like Tiffany Tsao or, you know, Intan Paramadita are people who, and again, I count authors who are being translated as part of that network. And I think that's really important because I think um, as someone who is both, I've been both, I've been translated into Vietnamese, one of my books, and then I, I also translate. I think it's really good to see it from both sides, 
Um, and it's really good to be aware of what an author is thinking, as well as what you you are, um, what you need to look out for as a translator. So I think I've, um, uh, I'm lucky in that our circles are, you know, most authors um, who are translators will be willing to share that information I found. And then also, but I think it's also in terms of having a sense of collectivity and an understanding of the lay of the land in terms of also inequalities in the translation scene and how we can work together as a collective to sort of fight against that. Um, and again, I think a lot of networking happened on social media. <laughs> so for instance, it's like, oh, this group of authors, you know, is coming for the London Book Fair. Um, and then you see who they're and you're like, oh yeah, I met them once in Jakarta. Or, oh yeah, I know this person. And then you talk about um, similar things you might be going through or what you might wanna do. Um, and in terms of translation activism, I remember when Indonesia was the, uh, the country of, country of choice, <laughs> country du jour of the London Book Fair, country of the year <laughs> in um, 2019, uh, Tiffany Tsao and I decided to publish twin essays on the same day at exactly the same time, myself on Modern Poaching Translations website because I was then the inaugural poet in residence. And then um, Tiff with um, Electric Lit and we both cover different aspects of inequality and um, uh, inequities that we saw in the translation scene with regards to Indonesia's role as, as, as the country of the London Book Fair that year, but from different angles that complemented each other. And we made sure to link at the bottom to each other's essay and highlight like these are twin essays. Um, and that's an example of, uh, you know, women coming together <laughs> really um, to say like, it doesn't have to be so official. It can really be, I think they're um, having outlets like that and contacts like that in terms of publishers online is a way to quickly respond to a situation and do so in a coordinated way so that, you know, <laughs> we double our impact. Um, and and that, that's just one example of how I think collectivity can work and can, can um, uh, make creative change. Thank you. That, that sort of answers one of my next questions, which is about kind of profile and visibility. Um, uh, translators, just like writers, need to have uh, have a certain degree of uh, visibility um, through social media or through whichever kind of channels they, they choose or prefer. Um, do you find, Ruth uh, and uh, Savad, do you find that you, you have to maintain a kind of presence online one way or another? I'll ask, I'll ask you first, Ruth. I'm terrible at Twitter. <laughs> so, so I, I have this constant battle of, I know it would be really good for me, but the amount of time I spend worrying about, like I've got such a translator brain for these things. Like, I think if you're an interpreter and you can, you can produce something and you, like, you're happy with it, you throw it out there, people hear it, you don't mind. Like if you're a translator, there's a real tendency to be like, this isn't perfect. I have to hold on to it for like about three months until I'm ready to show it to the world. That Twitter's not really the place for that. <laughs> um, so I feel like it, re it definitely really helps, but I'm terrible at it. And you can kind of get, get by without it. But I think there's a real, like translation Twitter is a thing and Savad is good at it. So I'll, I'll... <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Know, yeah, I was gonna say I love Twitter. I feel like Twitter has been responsible for a lot of my work. Um I would say like if you have a community of translators, you could signal boost each other's tweets, like you know, when they've done an article or using the hashtag like am translating. If you're an emerging translator, you could just put something out there, a conundrum you're struggling with, or something you think that you actually managed to successfully land. And you can just be like, you know, managed to translate, blah, 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 hashtag am translating. Like there's so many translators who are looking at those hashtags. And the other one is hashtag XL8, which is translate. Um, and then people, if, you know, I just randomly do that. I type in those hashtags and I see something cool with somebody I don't even know. And I'm just, and I just retweet it. And, you know, there's so many, then it just picks up momentum. I mean, that's the beauty of Twitter, right? Whether it's good or bad, th something can become viral in a matter of, you know, minutes. Um, yeah. So I would say having a presence online for me has been key even prior to the pandemic but even more so in the middle of this pandemic if you're a translator you need to be online uh 
So not only are you able to find out about workshops and master classes and attend those which are now online, you know, I attended one yesterday run by you know, University of Durham, which I wouldn't have been able to attend before because I live in Cambridge. Uh, but more than that, it's just um, letting people know what you're up to, that you're here, you know, you're available to, to take on work. Um, or even just engage, like, you know, discuss even just translation issues with someone from a different language pair. Uh, what I will say is even also, you know, some people question the um, benefit of having a website. I would say I just put up my website maybe three months ago and I already got two offers of work through that website. One was a graphic novel and the other one is a short uh, piece like translating a summary for a website. But uh, I wasn't expecting that. However, I think just because everything has really been forced online now in the middle of the pandemic, like publishers are really looking online and they are looking, you know, on Twitter and stuff. And I think even on top of that is that now I think a lot of publishers are open and interested in having their translators alongside authors at events. And so if you are a translator who can show that you're, you know, confident speaking in, you know, online events, you're confident in, you know, speaking about your mind on Twitter, or you're just advocating for your literature. I think publishers are more likely to have um, a tendency to choose you perhaps to do a book if you have a profile on your own as a translator, as opposed to, you know, someone who's never been online and doesn't have anything on Twitter. I'm not saying like you have to have millions of followers and, you know, an Instagram and whatever, but I think being online, not only are you, is it important to put something out, but also you can receive a lot of great stuff from uh, translation Twitter. And it's a safe space. I know like Twitter in general can be dangerous, but I have found translation Twitter to be very kind. Brilliant, thank you. Um, there's been loads of questions on the YouTube channel. Please keep them coming. I'm going to try and get through as many of them as possible. Um, two have come up, which are sort of uh, um, both sides, uh, different sides of the same coin, which is about, um, well, one is, is, is about, uh, could anybody recommend any opportunities for voluntary translation work? Um, um, even if it's uh, in particular kind of opportunities from uh, or four translators that haven't had anything published before um, and have kind of minimal experience. Um, and so, so that's one question. The other is how do, um, how can translators kind of work together to um, fight for kind of equal conditions, equal terms, equal pay and things like that. So, I mean, it's, it's a really difficult one because, you know, unpaid voluntary work is a, is a problematic area. Does anybody have any thoughts on either of those two? I do, but I want to see if Oka wants to say something first. Oh, um, I was actually, well, it's funny, I was just going to quote you in saying that knowledge is power, because I think that, um, uh, as I mentioned in like a recent Shadow Heroes Collective, like uh, a colleague of mine just tweeted at myself and another um, translator colleague, like, did you know about this thing related to contracts? Just like sort of put that on Twitter. Um, and, <laughs> you know, the it the more you know and the more you ask also I think like don't be afraid to say I have no idea what this part of this contract means you know like don't let your fear of oh I'm inexperienced I don't know you know like um, stop you from trying to find contacts that might be able to help you there are unions um, I know that in Society of Authors as a union it has translators association within it um, so it's kind of, it's like a subgroup of Society of Authors, um, if you want to check that out. And uh, yeah, just that to start, so what, what were you going to say? Oh, I was going to say in terms of, um, it's interesting that people are asking about unpaid opportunities. I have a lot of unpaid opportunities I can tell you about. Um, so, but I would, I was anticipating people would be more interested in paid opportunities. But in terms of unpaid, I'm focusing specifically for Arabic because that's my field. I would say definitely contact Arab Lit. That's where I initially did a lot of my author interviews and, you know, literary um like press releases, book reviews, and things like that. You can also do asymptote. I mean, they pay for their special feature, but otherwise usually they have a translation Tuesdays thing you could do. They also always have positions which are unpaid in terms of um, editors at large. Uh, there's Wasafiri magazine, which is currently looking for 
um, editors in Indonesia, Singapore, New Zealand, or if you're familiar with any of those literatures, so you could be based in, you know, the UK, but they're not paid. So, but having said that, they have said, especially Wasafiri said that they would be help, helping people um, make contacts in the publishing industry. So they're not paying, but they can link you up with paid opportunities. You would also be able to uh, showcase your work as a translator. So I think Wasafiri does pay for the events that are part of that editorial ship. Just wanted to say that. So. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, but that's um, W-A-S-I-F-I-R-A, Wasafiri, W-A-S-A, sorry, Fury. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so Asymptote, Arablet, Wasafiri, and I mean, there's a bunch of places online you can place things like unpaid. Uh, so if you just look on submittable, uh, also, uh, you can check there. Asian American Writers Workshop and, and similar um, journals online who are also really looking for translation work have calls for submission. Um, and if you uh, follow, you know, Asian literary Twitter <laughs> or just search for it online, you can search for call for submit submissions. And I think more and more journals, literary journals, um, even those that are considered quote unquote mainstream have an, taken an interest in translation in recent years and really solicit works in translation. So um, look for literary journals that aren't necessarily under the banner of translation as well. They usually have a section. I yeah. think yesterday, um people were talking about the, um, there's a collective database that was set up by Charlotte Coombe, um, which has a, 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 a lot of information about um, public translation and publishing. And, um, and there's a section for journals, I think, of translation focused and translation friendly journals that would like submissions of, of your translations. Um, so yeah, check that. Yeah, it's, that's the Charlotte Coombe's uh, literary, uh... Lit literary translators database. Uh, I think we posted a, um, a link uh, yesterday, but we'll definitely repost it again. Um, there's a specific question, I guess, for you, Ruth, which is, uh, does anyone have any advice on uh, breaking into uh, translating poetry from French to English? I guess modern poetry translation? Yeah, um, I mean, again, this is someone who knows a lot more about poetry than I do. <laughs> um, but um, in terms of French I mean it's I think with poetry it's much more important that you find like a space for poetry than you think about the language combination because there's translation friendly and there's poetry friendly and there's that, they, that kind of narrows down the places that you might want to um, submit um, but I think again find find stuff that you that you love that you want to translate and um, certainly in my experience um, the Modern Poetry and Translation and the uh, Poetry Translation Center, um, I would I would talk to them. Um, but Oka maybe have more uh, concrete connections, I don't know. I guess you're, you're right, it's good to know which which publishers are interested in poetry to start with and, and then which ones sure. of those uh, specialize in, in translation, I guess, uh, ARC, uh, which is based in uh, Tabada, uh, is, is a key one. Um, uh, Oka, do you have any others to throw in there? Um, yeah, with regards to MPT and PTC, um, they what have a is, wide... Sorry, sorry, do you want to say what those are? Because I don't oh, know. Oh, sorry. Modern Poetry and Translation and Poetry Translation Center. Um, they do a wide range of things. And in terms of, um, you could like attend a workshop or do a workshop online or um, which involves, uh, you know, an exercise in translation, you could apply to be, or you could just contact them and ask, if they have any um, spaces for to be um, uh, the translator who works in the workshops. Um, they also do readers reports. So um, yeah, to, to, to think about also um, building knowledge in those areas as well. One thing that's really important, I guess, to say also is to, uh, if you're working from a particular language, um, you should try to research those or, or become familiar with those kind of ministries of culture, which uh, support and champion literature uh, from those countries. So each country in Europe generally has uh, an institute of one form or another, which kind of promotes um, uh, their literature and uh, produces sample translations and things like that. With with German, it's new books in German. Uh, with Norwegian, it's Norla. With uh, Sweden, it, uh, it's the Swedish Arts Council. Um, with uh, yeah, so. So, so each language does have its own kind of 
um, Ministry of Cultural Equivalent, which is really um, championing those those languages. And I suppose they're really important for uh, young translators to kind of establish themselves and and, and build their reputation. Um, there's a there's uh, there's lots of other questions. There's a, the question about bi bilinguality. Um, uh, if an author is is bilingual, there seems to be a preference to ha have someone else translate their work. Um, I'm curious as to as to why this is. Is it tradition or is it something else? Um, distance from the, you know distance from their work or whatever. Does anybody have any thoughts about that or experience on that issue? I guess I guess it's true of many Indonesian authors. Okay. I mean. I think that um, it depends on what language the author knows, right? And what the, and their level of familiarity in the target language as well, um, which varies from author to author. Um, I think that uh, there is a distance, but I, I don't see why people couldn't translate. And I think um, uh, as, it was written by the editors of the Book of Jakarta in the recent Kama Press anthology, you know, there's this misconception that Indonesians don't translate our own work. And to understand also that um, having a translator is, it doesn't necessarily mean going out. Yes, the Book of Jakarta, whoa, <laughs> doesn't necessarily, yeah, I have, ta-da, wow, I'm also like very prepared. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean going outside of of the country for for translators and to understand that, um, uh, I think I actually encourage more authors to consider self translation. Being biased as somebody who does that, um, to sort of say that you know you can do this if you are bilingual. It's you know, um, but then again, some authors might prefer to have that distance. It, I think it varies. Um, there's. Uh... There's an, another question. It's 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 aimed at you again, oh, okay? But it's but it's really something I'm sure everybody uh, can chip in on. Um, I'm really glad to to see you advocate, okay, okay um, for not italicizing foreign words uh, in translated text. Um, and uh, they're interested to hear other people's uh, kind of viewpoint on this um, and and their their experience of whether publishers have uh, preferred. Um, uh, italicizing translated words or untranslated words rather, foreign words in quotes? Um, I think that I'd be interested to hear what Ruth and Savad have to say about their experiences as well. Um, I can say that having written that article was first of all one of the best decisions of my life because it's so easy to just say here I wrote a whole essay about it you know rather than having to explain per job or whatever like this is why I won't do it and I've had editors change their whole book policy because of that article um, I've had uh, Man Massachusetts Review um, change their whole editorial policy based on that article yeah I saw I've that had, yeah and I've had like editors from like, like the copy editor for like Sports Illustrated which is hilarious because I don't <laughs> I'm like, really? Okay. Uh, really. You know, like really consider it. Um, and it, the conversations that I'll sometimes lurk and like search like what conversations are happening around this article because it's it, I published it last January and it's perennially like coming up always. Yeah. Always the objections, by the way, um, are from white people <laughs> who always, always for some reason, who misunderstand and are like, oh, it's a matter of clarity or like I'm non plus and always they their objections to it are based on their not having read the article to the end. <laughs> so I think it's it's quite rich of people to, and it shows, you know, the closed mindedness of people like, I'm not even going to read this article. I know my opinion, you know, rather than really, you know, delving into the subtleties of the article and even misunderstanding, like there's um the illustration that came with it, which is really great, had like all these food names. And I've had like multiple people in the comments be like, you know, tacos not supposed to be italicized according to the dictionary. And I'm like, yeah, that's the point of the illustration. It's like, why not italicize taco, but you italicize injera, you know? Um, so I think like, there's just a lot of education that still needs to be done, but it's so handy. And this is why I would love, you know, more and more people to write about their stances on certain parts of translation, because it's so easy to then just like, a link and to share it around and I think other translator colleagues have been able to benefit from it as well hopefully. Yeah definitely I've quoted that article to you know some publishers I've worked with 
And I think it's just, it's really about like the hierarchy of languages in English translation, which makes sense that like historically, right? Like countries like France and England have a really, you know, um, close uh, relationship. And so as a result, there's a lot of words in the English language that have come from French, right? But there's also a lot of words in the English language that have come from Arabic, but you just don't know it. So for example, the word lemon, it's come from limon, which is from the Arabic, right? Um, the a word a giraffe comes from zarafa, right? So there's a lot of words in English that you're using that you don't actually realize, like sabun, soap, right? Is from Arabic. So all I'm saying is that, you know, when we, um, recently I translated a book and I was at a book club, which was reviewing this book of mine. And one of the, you know, one of the organizers was like, why is there so much Arabic in your translation? And I'm just like, do you have, you, you know, at the time I was too scared to actually say, you know, because I am, it is a conscious decision and I am, you know, challenging the hierarchy of languages in English translation. But at the time I was saying, oh, because I'm bringing across, across like the, you know, authenticity when you're traveling to example for this book is about Kuwait. When you travel to Kuwait and, you know, even if you, when you don't speak Arabic, I'm uh, reproducing that feeling you have of going to a new country where you're going to get some things from gestures, right? Facial expressions. You go to a new country, you don't automatically understand everything. I'm taking you along on the journey. I'm giving you that help. But at the same time, I want you to also make an effort to try to understand what's going on. So having said that, afterwards, what I, what I wanted to say actually in the moment was that no one has ever said, why is there so much French in this book? Have you ever, ever heard anybody say that? I've never heard anybody say that, right? Like... <laughs> That's, it is what it is and you just accept it and the whole point is just trying to bring people closer to different cultures like I've had reviewers of my book in the subcontinent who love all the Arabic in the book because they're closer to the Arabian Peninsula right and there are just so many connections that they can make immediately um, I actually had a reviewer complain that I had taken out too much Arabic and this is because I was dealing you know with different publishers at the time my own approach to translation was going back and forth because I lost confidence in what I was doing but having heard from like you know different readers it's just you can't please everybody so you have to really decide what you as a translator want to do and why yeah fantastic um I don't know if Ruth do you want to jump in on that or uh, I can there's lots of other questions um, well I was just I was just going to say it's difficult working in some of those languages like uh French and Italian where we have adopted already a lot of, of words especially for food and then you have like well of course we're not going to italicize pizza but what's this word can we not just write stew um and it's not either you lose no pun intended but you lose the flavor or you um or you have to then explain what what the stew contains and again like like Savard said if you go to a place and somebody says oh you should try this you know, whatever the name of the, the local speciality is, or even like if when you go to Sicily, you should try Ricci, Ricci, Ricci. And it, you just keep hearing this word and you're like, well, I have to try it. What is it? And you order it and you don't know what it is. And it comes, it's a plate of spiky sea urchins and they're terrifying. <laughs> um, but it's like, maybe we could just like leave some of those hints in of, of like, well, that's just, that's just local flavor. Yeah. And it also says a lot about intended audience and the imagined audience, right? And, you know, so much of the world, we live in more than one language. We live in more than one culture, um, all are like access to different cultures. So I think the assumption that all readers are monolingual, that they come from a specific culture is also, you know, something that we, we shouldn't be perpetuating. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, we, we could uh, continue this conversation for some time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even going to go on to footnotes and endnotes and things like that. Yeah, um, <laughs> you want to say something, wrong. Recipe. <laughs> uh, so Vad and I have had an ongoing dialogue, should we say? Yes. <laughs> about about endnotes. Uh, there was a there was actually a, a, um, a study done in I think it was about 2011. It's a long time ago. Uh, done by um, Tran, um, Audiences London, which was a, a report done for Telegram. Uh, part of the uh, Saki books, which uh, kind of surveyed people, um, reading groups who were reading groups that were looking at translated text. And one of the findings from that was that audience do like uh, to learn stuff. Um, um, they do like um, footnotes or endnotes. I try to use endnotes um, so they don't get in the way of the actual reading experience. But um, mm -hmm. there is an opportunity to, um, to, to 
dive into you know references historical references or or, or historical figures things like that um and they they learn in the process of reading or they have the option to learn um but i think there's there's a there's a whole uh, kind of dialogue around that uh, which could go on for some time and we've only got about five minutes left. <laughs> about six more questions um so um somebody's asked um have you ever have you ever found your translation work has gone beyond uh, the, the printed page of the book or the private page of the book and and taken on a, a life in other medium uh, other media or or elsewhere in the community? Mm. And um, I can I can leave that one hanging. Um, there's another question um, about uh, translation opportunities for for non-European languages. A lot of the uh, the opportunities out there um, seem to be um kind of focused on european languages um yeah. and also large languages uh, we've, we've talked about our uh, arabic and, and chinese is obviously a key one um are there any specific groups uh networks or publishers uh that kind of uh focus on minority languages and and small languages i guess is the, the question yeah i mean oh okay go first oh no you go first i was gonna say tilted access press i mm -hmm. mean that's a, I mean, they focus on Asia and, you know, they have translated stuff from uh, Tamil by Mina Kandasami. I think they've done some Urdu poetry. Uh, I think they have something in Punjabi coming out, uh, but that's in terms of a publisher and Deborah is very approachable uh, on um, Twitter. Uh, I'm just forgetting her last name. Can somebody please help us? Yes, Deborah Smith. Yeah, so you should look her up on Twitter. She's very approachable. If you have a project you'd like to pitch and you work from a language that you find is not really in the mainstream and it's from Asia, that's a great place to go. Um, Oka, okay, please. Oh, no, I was also going to say, well, the word small is relative, right? Like Indonesian oh. is, Indonesia is the fourth largest country in the world by population. <laughs> There's so many hundreds of millions of people who speak this language. It's not small. Um, but I think it, so... Another thing is to look not only at publishers or presses that operate in Europe and English speaking countries, there are things like the Mekong Review, you know, which is great for Southeast Asian language translation. And, and increasingly there are more and more micro presses, micro journals that are in, and journals that become bigger that um, deal with, you know, all manner of Asian languages. There's like Asian Cha Journal or, you know, um, Asian Literary Review or, um, looking at there are also journals for instance for Asian Australian writers like Peril magazine right or Asian American writers like Asian American writers workshop again um that will welcome your languages if they're from Asia fantastic um we there's been lots of references to to links and uh networks and uh publication uh, magazines etc cetera, etc cetera. um we're going to try and gather all of those up and uh we'll we'll post them on uh on on twitter uh at comma press uh, so if you've missed any of these um these links or you haven't been able to write them down quickly enough um we will repost them and, and thank everybody and thank you everyone for for all of your kind of uh, tips and advice one last question because we've only got two minutes left um <laughs> what would be your your kind of recommendation in terms of self-care and uh your your one sort of uh last piece of advice to to translators i know that uh, a lot of translators talk about how solitary uh and intense and and uh lonely it can be as as a as a career or as a job as a as a practice uh and i know antonio lloyd jones the polish translator um uh, talks about the need to have a cat uh to 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 go and stroke every 40 minutes and uh jonathan wright the arabic translator talks about smoking i, I don't recommend smoking but uh, <laughs> every, every 40 minutes he, he needs a break uh these kind of weird self-care in quotes uh recommendations sort of uh, have float around is there anything you would recommend uh to uh, to translators just to kind of um, keep themselves sane as well as uh, as well as kind of surviving financially. Uh, my favourite bit of advice is from uh, the legendary Spanish translator Edith Grossman, um, who in a masterclass once told us, "If your translation is not working today, go for a walk. Go for a walk. Clear your head. Think about it. I know Roche Schwartz also recommends swimming. Anything where you're um, moving your body 
and you're, you're not really supposed to be focusing on that translation problem. You're supposed to be just going for a walk and enjoying the walk and maybe something will come to you or maybe just like loosening, like lubricating those joints in your mind as well as your body will, will something will, will click. Um, and maybe you'll feel like doing it when you get back. Um, then she said, if that still doesn't work, have a cocktail. <laughs> yeah. so. okay. Oh, for me. Oh, um, I would say usually I would go running as, um, you know, Ruth was saying, but in lockdown, what I've uh, done instead is watched a lot of foreign language shows on Netflix. Um, I've just, it's great. The subtitling is wonderful, especially for Arabic. Like uh, when I was working on a Kuwaiti book, I watched like hours of Kuwaiti TV shows, but yeah, so Netflix, I know it sounds crazy, um, or just taking time away to read like something that is not related to translation, just reading for, for reading sake. And you'll find your, if you're looking for a solution it inevitably comes up when you're reading just because of all those things, yeah, which are working and good food, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Definitely. I would say uh, meditation or some kind of spiritual practice, which in my case sometimes involves Candy Crush while listening to a podcast. Um, <laughs> that's like my jam. And uh, also um, to read widely and just a quick response to a previous question about translation in different forms. Translation is multisensorial. And that's something that um, I work on in my academic life and artistic life. And it's everywhere. It's in Netflix, it's, you know, on Netflix shows, it's, it's plays, it's, and there's so much out there. So there's so many ways to get translation other than through the written word. And if you um, want to seek it, it is there on the internet usually. And public libraries also good for free checkout. Fantastic. Well, uh, we've we've run out of time, but uh, it just remains for me for me to to thank our, our three fantastic guests, uh, Harani, Baroka, uh, Ruth Clark, and Savat Hussein. And uh, thank uh, thank you everyone for joining uh, Manchester in Translation th this year. Uh, there is one more workshop this afternoon, uh, but that's that's the end of this year's uh, um, conference. Uh, and please please join us again next year. <laughs>